Let's uh, open our Bibles, Acts chapter 20, and this is going to sort of fit in with uh, what I was preaching on this morning, and just kind of matches pretty good uh, with the Spirit of the Lord and the Word of God, and what happens when the Spirit of the Lord is gone, what happens when it's wiped out, or what happens when God takes away the spirit of the Lord and an unclean spirit or an evil spirit goes. Just think of, uh, if you want to just do a study, study Saul's life. In fact, I may do that sometime. Just uh, come out here Sunday night, Wednesday night, whatever, and do a, a study of Saul and where, how he started. And you'd be surprised at how Saul started. He started out preaching and then turned to witchcraft okay it happens it happened with him and believe it or not I've read some articles online from obviously some Calvinists or whatever and they said well obviously Saul's in heaven because Calvinism okay and that's it they just say because of Calvinism he's in heaven and uh, that's what so w that's what happens okay he may not get the reward that David will get, but the Bible says God took his mercy away from Saul, which means he quit forgiving his sins. That's scary. That's sobering. That's what it should be, okay? And uh, so anyway, but uh, it, it, Saul's sin was he rejected the word of the Lord. He rejected it. And this is what we see happening all around us. Okay, your belief in the Bible should not make you proud. It's not something we stand on a pedestal over everybody with. It should make you humble that God hasn't turned you over like he has other people. Amen. So let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Appreciate you coming out and uh, good to be with you. And uh, just remember, we sing these songs and it's because we believe something. We believe that our Savior, God, the Creator, came to this world to live like you and I. To eat food and to know what hunger is, to know what sleepless nights are like, to know what pain is, to know what suffering is all about, to know the sting of death, losing loved ones to death. And um, He encountered all of that. And we have a Savior, a High Priest who is touched with our infirmities, so that when we go to him, he knows exactly how we feel. Amen? Jesus, we thank you for being our Savior. We thank you for being the captain of the host. We thank you for being the high priest and the lamb, and we thank you for the blood. We thank you for your atonement. We thank you that you are standing at the right hand of your Father, being our mediator. On behalf of us and on behalf of God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you do for us. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that you sent. It is, the, it is your Spirit, the Spirit of God's Son in us that cries, Abba, Father. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for uh, praying our prayers better than we pray them, for asking God things better than what we ask, for helping us, Lord, with our unbelief and helping us with our life we thank you father for sending your son we thank you for uh, having mercy on us and allowing us to be in your house and to come into your presence and we thank you lord that you put it in us to believe your word and to believe what you said in an age where that's not popular anymore in an age where it just seems like one person after another one church after another doesn't want to do that anymore Father, we thank you, Lord, for the gift of your word, and we ask your blessings on it as we study it tonight. Uh, Lord, teach us great and mighty things. Teach us, Father, Lord, the diligence of study and the diligence of holding fast this faithful word so that it never departs from us. We never depart from it. We thank you for being faithful to us. We ask your help in letting us be faithful to you always. Bless your word. Bless people tonight, Lord, that are uh, having a hard time physically, emotionally, spiritually. 
I pray, God, that you would just bless them tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Acts chapter 20, turn there. And uh, we're going we're gonna to look at Paul's last warning uh, that he sent uh, before he died uh, because he knew what was going to happen. He knew that Paul was not as near as significant as the word that he was preaching. He knew that once he died, the work was still going to go on. The salvation of the Gentiles was still going to happen. He knew that the word of God was going to increase. So he wasn't worried that after his death, there would be no more Christians anymore. What he was concerned with was that very word that he preached that he knew would live past him would be corrupted in the hands of evil people. That's what he was worried about. Um, I know that if anything happens to me, God forbid, but if anything happens to me, I know that you people will carry on and God will carry you because I'm not near as significant and important as this book that I've been giving you for the last 20 some odd years and saying, hey, you need, well, I haven't been doing it for the last 20 some odd years, but most of that time I've been doing that. That God is going to continue to show you great and mighty things. He's going to continue to bless you because I'm telling you to read your Bible. Okay? I know that. But I also know that after I step down one way or the other, there's going to be wolves. And that's what Paul was saying. Verse 28 of Acts 20. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. What a costly, costly thing it was. For us to be purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. How expensive is that? Okay, that's what God thinks about you, by the way. Um, and, and verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And Jesus had something to say about that. He warned us about these wolves. And how is it that they would come in among us? How would they do that? They'd be wearing sheep's clothing. They would appear as lambs. Turn to Revelation 13. You're fixing to get a revelation here. Revelation 13. I want you to think about, think about what, what Jesus said, what Paul said. Revelation 13. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a what? But he spake as a... And you think about that. He speaks the way the dragon tells him to speak, but he comes in looking like a lamb. Okay? This false prophet is going to appear to be one of God's own men. After all, that's who Judas was. Judas was among the twelve. There's, boy, I tell you what, you stop and ponder this. It's going it's to shake you up a little bit. Judas was counted among the twelve. Jesus picked him for a reason. Of course, Jesus knew. And here he is going everywhere. And when, when I was reading this in Matthew the other day, when Jesus sent the disciples out, it listed by name, all 12 of them, Judas being the last. Judas was always mentioned last, though, just like Dan was always had to be the last one to leave when the camp of Israel moved. But Judas was always mentioned last, but he was always mentioned in that group of 12. And when Jesus sent them out, he sent them by twos. So someone always accompanied Judas. And the gospel was always preached. And Judas helped do that. But at some point, he turned. Okay, we're not sure exactly when, but at some point, Judas turned. Jesus ends up calling him the son of perdition. That's who Paul called the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2. And so we have somebody who is on the inside, counted among them, who ends up being the traitor. 
false prophet. He is, has two horns like a lamb. He appears to be a lamb. He appears to be a Christian. But his speech is that of the dragon. Okay? Now, I'm not 100% positive on exactly what that means, but I get the gist of it. Okay? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out the simple part of this. He is not a lamb. He's in league with the dragon, and he's not speaking the words of the lamb. He's speaking the words of the dragon. Okay? So, uh, the grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. That's what Jude said, that uh, certain men crept in unawares. Verse 30, And also of your own selves shall men arise. Paul was aware of this because he knew too many of the people that he had accompanied, people that he had prayed with, people that he had broke bread with, people that he had pastored, people that he saw rise up, he knew too many of them had turned away from the word of truth. And he knew that it was possible that people on the inside would end up being agents for the devil. Okay? So, and these people were all, have, all handling the word of God. But some of them ended up handling it deceitfully. So, also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things. There it is. I got a feeling that dragons talk that way. They speak perverse things and draw away disciples after them. That's why they call it Jimmy Swaggart Ministries. Um, was the Benny Hinn Ministries. Oral Roberts Ministries. They name it after themselves. Who's the, who's, who are people following? following the man they're following that man and whatever that man says that's what they believe and whatever that man does that's what they do and so on so they draw disciples after themselves therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years i ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears and now brethren i here it is now i commend you to god and to the word of his grace he says i'm going to put you in the very gentle but loving hands of god and i'm going to put you under the authority of the word of god and god's word is going to rule over you i don't rule over you god's word is going to rule over you and god's word in your life is going to do in you what god sent his word out to you some some of you God's going to carry you through into glory. But some of you, you're going to turn. You're going to turn against the very word that I've spent all my life preaching to you. And so the, the idea is that it's the word and the battle is, is against the word of God, the Bible. All right. Uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, turn there. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus, here's the deal about the sheep's clothing and wolves in sheep's clothing. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets. They're named prophets, but they are false prophets, uh, which come to you in sheep's clothing. But they're not sheep. They're wolves. But inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them. I had a. I had been thinking about this. You know, I, I like to watch on YouTube. I like to watch animals, lions and tigers and crocodiles and snakes and just. I like to see how they do things. Okay, and um, when a snake goes around and he finds him a field rat, and he eats the field rat. Does the snake think that he's done something wrong? When a snake finds a nest of rat babies, there'd be a whole nest of them, like 10 of them in a nest. When that snake finds that rat's nest and eats all those babies, does the snake go, 
I hate to do this, but I'm so hungry. He doesn't care. Okay? He doesn't care. Uh, when lions go after a gazelle and eat a gazelle, do they care? No, they have no conscience about it whatsoever. When you step on an ant or a cockroach or something, does that bother you that you killed that poor ant? That was some mother ant's baby. You can, does that bother you? No. It does not bother the false prophets to consume and devour church people. It does not bother them. Their conscience is beyond dealing with. It's been seared with a hot iron and they devour and consume. Do you think... Do you think Kenneth Copeland goes to bed every night feeling bad that he deceived all those people into sending him thousands of dollars every, every day? Doesn't bother him a bit. He was confronted one time before one of his speaking engagements. A television crew caught him kind of off guard as he was fixing to you know, walk out onto the stage. And he smiled for the camera, you know. He's a short guy. I didn't realize he was that short, but he's a short, little, skinny, squirrely guy. And um, they, you know, were interviewing him, and then they asked him about his million-dollar jet that he bought with everybody's money. And then they asked him about all the millions of dollars that he gets every month from people that, and, and they asked him, do, you know, what do you do with all this money, and do you feel like this is really a good way for you to spend these people's money and he immediately turned and he said that is none of your business and he turned around and walked off and of course his handlers were right there okay to cover up for him he had no conscience he had nothing to say because he didn't want his real identity to come out but he had no conscience about that it did not bother him and it does not bother these false prophets to be doing what they're doing as long as they get rich and as long as they get people following after them, it doesn't matter what they say and it doesn't matter what they do. This is why I'm constantly warning everybody, watch, watch out for what you're watching on YouTube and whose website you're getting your information from. These people do not care about lying. They don't care about manufacturing stories. And I'm not just talking about CNN. And they've been busted three times this week on false stories, okay? But... I'm talking about these people who are trying to get a big following on the internet or their, their website generates a lot of ad revenue because they got 15 ads surrounding this story that they wrote up. It does not bother them that they fudged the story or they made it sound real extreme because they're getting wealth from this and they're getting followers from this. They're getting YouTube fame and that's what they wanted to begin with. And it doesn't, what, what it does, sometimes I'll be honest with you, it bothers me that some of these quacks on YouTube are getting hundreds of thousands of views and I'm not. And it bothers me sometimes. And it's not my vanity, I don't think. It's just the fact that, my goodness, I'm giving everybody Bible verses. I'm giving them the Word of God and nobody's watching. And that bothers me a little bit. But I think it's an indicator of the times that we're living in. People just seems like would rather believe things that are not true than to believe the truth. Okay? So anyway, that's enough of that. So verse 16, ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit, period. And then he's going to say it kind of backwards a little bit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Now you ponder that. You read this Bible, and you study this book, and I guarantee you God will do nothing but good in your life. I guarantee you. Okay? Guarantee you. Whether he does it today, next week, next month, next year, I promise you God will do you good. This Bible, this tree, always produces good fruit. Remember what we found out this morning about the Spirit of the Lord. It cannot be constrained or straightened. Cannot be restrained. You cannot 
choked down the word of God and and in and, and somebody who believes it, you can't do it. Okay? Um, so anyway, he's, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and is cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. So, consider, consider the state of our country. Consider the fact that 1963, we decided that God was no longer allowed in our classrooms. Schools can't pray, can't talk about Jesus Christ and the Bible in there anymore. Can't do that stuff. I mean, I, I remember a time I was a child of the 70s. And so in the early 70s, I started school and we still rose and saluted the flag and sang or had played over the intercom a patriotic song of some kind. And that's how we started our day. Okay? And that was right in the, I guess, the heat of the Vietnam War. And we were still taught to be patriots and good citizens of America. Even if we were not taught Christianity and prayer, we were still taught that. That's not even allowed anymore in a lot of schools anymore. That's like, oh, that's offensive to our Muslim children who are here. Well, they're here. They should love America like everybody else does. Ain't, why are you here? Well, they have an agenda. Amen. But anyway, think of the state of America. Are we better off morally? Okay. Are we better off spiritually than we were during, during World War II? Let's compare now with World War II. Are we better off as far as morality is concerned? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That generation of people, if they were to look into the future and see the America that is now, it would shock literally every American. Even the liberal back then was not in their mind allowing things that what we're seeing right now, okay? Was not even allowing that. But that's the fruit that has been produced by liberalism, by removal of God and Christianity and the Bible in our country, okay? So then we, then we apply this to the church. What, how has the church benefited since 1963, 1973? 1973 is when the uh, NIV came out, okay? Has the church benefited or the churches of America, have they gotten better morally since 1973? Do you say no? I say no. Okay? Have they gotten better spiritually since 73? Absolutely not. Okay? And what's happened is we have just unleashed a flood. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, remember, the, in, the flood of the enemy has poured into denominations, churches, Bible college, seminaries, seminaries uh, Bible camps, um, Sunday schools, vacation Bible schools, you name it. The enemy has flooded false ideas, false gospels, false uh, ideas of morality and things like that. False ideas of salvation. Uh, the, the, just the idea of reading the Bible and believing it for what it says now has, has gone away to reading the Bible, but then imagining something greater than the Bible in your mind about God. Okay, that's what it's turned into. What do you think would happen? Todd, what would happen in your life if you just stopped reading the Bible, stopped praying, and uh, quit coming to Bethel Church? Do what? Go back to the way you used to be. Okay, only it wouldn't be the way it used to be. According to the Bible, it would be worse. Amen? Where's our Todd's in the building? Sure. That's the way it would be. Okay? If we turned, if we did like Saul, if we did a Saul here, 
And we decided that what God said was not as important as this outside appearance. And that's what Saul was doing. He was making it look good. And besides that, he was greedy for all the stuff that he was getting. Saul turned his back and he rejected God's word and it ended up being worse for him than it was at the beginning. He ended up plunging his own sword into his chest to end his life. Okay? That's how far away he was from God. Okay? So, by their fruits, ye shall know them. Now, turn to Deuteronomy 32. Boy, the day I, the day I discovered this in the Scriptures, it just has opened up a whole wealth of understanding and knowledge for me and hopefully for many of you. This is um, Moses. He says it in verse 30 of chapter 31, Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. So this is actually a song that Moses sings. I wonder what it would sound like. Okay? I wonder how he sang it. Be interesting. Um, in uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 31. For their rock, little r, is not as our rock, big r. Remember what Paul said, that rock was who? He's, okay, so now you have, you have the rock, which represents Christ, but... The enemies have a version of that, too. They have their rock, but it's a little r, so it's a lesser god. Okay? So their rock is not as our rock. Um, when they took rock and they put the hammer and the chisel to it, then they would carve out an image. They would carve out an image of Dagon or, or an image of Molech or an image of of, you know, Ashtaroth or Isis or any of the gods or goddesses. They would carve out this image and that was the, and the idea. They would say that certain rocks are sacred rocks. Well, why are they sacred rocks? Because hidden inside of that rock is a god. Wow, you mean inside that rock is a god? Yes. Well, how can he come out? Let's chip off the outer layers of this rock, and lo and behold, there he is. <laughs> and it's just a rock. Our rock, no man's hands has been laid to him. Amen? That's why in, in Daniel 2, he's the rock, he's the stone that's been cut out without hands. He is able to destroy the image that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of in Daniel chapter 2. Okay? Our rock is better than their rock. Okay? So anyway, for their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. Our enemies know that their religion is not like ours. Okay? The same people who say, well, all religions serve the same God, except you Bible Christians. Okay? They're right. We don't. And we're not going to. Okay? We're the holdouts. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom. And remember, I have it up on the screen, John 15, 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. So we have two vines given in the Bible. We have the vine of Christ, and it's true. He said, I'm the true vine, which means not only am I the real one you should follow, but everything that I say is true. He said in John 17, thy word, he said, you know, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So he, he, he settled it right there that it's his word that is the truth. And then so on the other side, we have a different, we have, just like we have a different rock, we have a different vine. And those two vines are going to produce two entirely different fruits. It's just like the wheat and the tares that we saw last Sunday when, when the, when the, Fruit is finally ready from both the wheat and the tares. There's a very distinct knowledge of who is and who isn't. It's not a mystery anymore. It's not 
you know, well, we just can't, we can't judge who is and who isn't. I'm telling you, there's coming a day when everybody's going to know whose side everybody's on. Okay, it's just like two teams playing basketball. They never, the two opposing teams never wear the same jerseys. It's not, by the way, Hillsborough won, Caleb. 76 to 64, I think. Okay, anyway, we've been following a little tournament that's been going on, okay? So anyway, but Hillsboro wore a different jersey than the opposing team. Football teams, the same way, because you throw a football down the field, if everybody's wearing the same, wearing the same jersey, you have no idea who's playing for who. And it's going to be this way. At some point, it is going to be the difference between apples and oranges. Okay? And you can decide which fruit you like the least, if the bad people are the apples or the oranges, okay? Uh, anyway, so their vine is the vine of Sodom, and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes, here's the fruit now. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Okay? What is gall? Where's my medical team? What is gall? Anybody know? Um, I think it's a different galled. I think it's a different thing. It's a bitter liquid. Okay? Huh? Like wormwood. Okay? The, the term for it now is absinthe. Okay, and absinthe um, is, it comes from this bitter wormwood type plant, and they make this liquor out of it, and it's real bitter, but it has hallucinogen, you don't just get drunk, you get spaced, okay, absinthe is a hallucinogen, and it brings not only a drunken state, but you hallucinate, like you would if you were on LSD or something like that, depending on how much you take. And you just get an out-of-this-world experience with it, okay? It doesn't just mess you up. It messes you up a million miles away, okay? And so anyway, it's a, it's a bad thing. So that, that grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. It is wormwood, okay? Well, that's how I see it. But anyway, think about, and I've, I've said this before, but... It just makes sense now in the world that we're living in. Since their vine is not the true vine, and it's the vine of Sodom, Megan, what's the fruit of that? Of the vine of Sodom, what fruit is it going to produce? Say Sodom. Say sodomy. Well, say it louder. Okay, very good, Megan. That's very good. Okay. It just makes sense. Makes sense that we find out that people who've been in churches for years are coming out of the closet. It makes sense that pastors. I got um, a funeral bulletin on my desk sent from one of our followers up in Minnesota. And a church that they used to go to, I think, I'm trying to remember the story, but anyway, the, it was a Baptist church, and the pastor uh, walked out way out in the middle of nowhere one day and blew his brains out. And when they was trying, when the church was trying to understand why, they found out that he was being investigated for multiple sodomizing of boys. Multiple. He had been doing it for years. And finally it was all catching up with him. And so his solution was to go out and blow his brains out. And the funeral notice, the funeral bulletin, I could read it to you, but it said something, you know, such and such name, now in the loving and forgiving arms of Jesus. And uh, I don't know, okay? But that's the fruit. But not only that, if, if the true vine is believed and preached and followed, we would never say sodomy is okay. 
We would never say that. We'd never believe it. But with the vine of Sodom, you have churches and pastors and pastorettes and then denominations that are saying it's okay now to be sodomite, to be homosexual. We will now start joining them in their unions. We, and, you know, so it's one thing when the liberal godless crowd are saying, oh, everybody's bigoted. We think these sodomites should be married. But then when certain churches join in, churches join in, not choices join in, <laughs> certain churches join in with that, that gives them justification. See, these churches are on our side. How come you bigoted, hateful churches are not on our side? So it's basically, they're the ones drawing the line, which is fine. They're the ones drawing the line, and I'm not crossing it. And the true vine followers won't cross it. Okay? But the people who have been receiving of the vine of Sodom all of these years, a, a corrupt tree cannot produce good fruit and while it may not have seemed like a big deal in the 70s and 80s and 90s when all these churches were abandoning the King James and going to these new Bibles from the vine of Sodom while everybody said what's the big deal they still believe in you know basic ideas of Christianity they still believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and believe the blood and all these things fruit takes time now we're seeing the fruit. And the fruit is an open acceptance of sin, which by its very nature, you have to change what the gospel is. Because if you accept sin, the real gospel serves no purpose in a church that openly accepts sin. So the real gospel, which is God dealing with our sin by the blood of His Son, since now we, have, we are accepting sin, some of the major sins now, we have to change what the gospel is all about. And so now the other doctrines are affected as well. And it all goes back to the vine that they were pulling from. It may not have been seen back 20 or 30 or 40 years ago what these new Bibles would produce, but now we're seeing it. And since we're seeing it now, my question is, how come churches are still drawing from the vine of Sodom? Seeing what it's doing. I, get, I don't know. I don't get it. So anyway, um, for 2 Kings chapter 4. Turn there. And my, here's my hope right here in 2 Kings 4. This is my hope. Because I was one of these sons of the prophets in this story. And I think that there's hopefully still some good men out there that the worse it gets, the more they'll see which Bible they should be using. Okay? But here's what I hear. I hear some of my good friends down in Arkansas they're fighting a battle in their districts, in their denominational districts, over which Bible to use. So here are all these churches that for years, these guys were tremendous friends, and they are all seemingly conservative pastors. Now, one of them brings up this Bible issue at, on the district level, saying, um, you know, I preach out of the English Standard Version, so when I preach at the quarterly meeting, I want to be able to preach out of my English Standard Version. And the pastors that I know who thought they had good friends that would have stood up against this, those guys didn't stand up against it. And so now they're finding out who is and who isn't. And it's a real battle for these guys. So 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 38, here's my hope. And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a dearth in the land. Remember, be careful about letting yourself get too hungry. Be careful about, 
You know, every now and then we get a little laziness in us. Every now and then we don't want to read the Bible as much one day or whatever. Okay, I get it. I get it. But the longer you go not feeding yourself with the Bible, the hungrier you'll get. The hungrier you get, you'll eat just about anything offered to you. Okay? Remember that. Stray away a little, come back a little. Stray away a lot, you got a long road, come back. And the devil will be there ready to feed you. Remember what Amos told us. God said, Behold, I sent a famine in the land, a famine for hearing the words of the Lord. Okay, not of bread, not of water but a a spiritual famine where God's word is not heard. So here's a dearth in the land. And the sons of the prophet were sitting before him, and he said unto his servant, Set on the great pot and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. Do you know what pottage is? Anything that will fit in a pot. Okay? Do you have a, Lynn, do you have a pottage recipe? Did your mama ever teach you? She grew up in the Depression, right? So whatever they could find, they threw it into a pot, right? It's got different names in different areas, but it's all the same thing, okay? Take a little bit of this that we found, a little bit of that that, he, that daddy killed. We don't know what it is. We don't want to know what it is. It's meat. We're going to put it in there, okay? And they just find various things and boil them all together, and that's what they have. So they have, they were going to seethe pottage. Okay, you're going to make some stew here for the sons of the prophets. One went out to the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine. Okay, it was not cultivated, was not cultured, was not, it was just growing out there. And gathered thereof wild gourds, his lap full. Boy, he thought he, look what I found, I found a bunch of it. And came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat. And it came to pass, as they were eating of the pottage, that they cried out and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. So, here's my hope. My hope is that there's some people out there who are hungry. And they're starving. But God's let them retain some of their old-fashioned values, old sense that they used to know, okay? Had I not grown up, Lynn, in this church with preachers preaching nothing but a King James Bible, there's no telling how I would have turned out. But because I knew what to come back to because of the men that preached here, God made it easy for me. I knew where the poison was. And I went and tasted some of the poison, and I said, I can't do this. I, there, I can't have, not have anything to do with this, okay? That's how God set me back on the road to where I needed to be. And my hope is there's still some churches out there, some people out there, some pastors out there who have enough of the old-time way to know that when the famine comes and there's one coming of hearing the words of the Lord, that when these guys get good and hungry, when they start really tasting these wild vines that these churches are, and these Bibles represent, they'll realize there's death. It, it, which is better, to die of a famine or die of what you're eating? It's death. It's still death, either way. Okay. Now, Elisha had a remedy, and he put a stick in there. That's what he did. He put a stick in there, and it and healed it. Okay, I think that stick represents Christ, the rod. Okay, that's what I think. I'm not, maybe not positive on that, but that's what I think. I think it represents the rod of the stem of Jesse with the seven spirits of God in it. Okay, and that sanctified what it was they were eating, and those guys lived. But it purified what it was they were eating, so they recognized when they put it to their lips that there was something in it that was toxic. God designed us to where we only like to eat things that won't kill us. Amen? We only like to eat things that won't kill us. Okay? Immediately. 
okay? Now, they might kill us long term, you know, in 40 years, but anyway, but that's how it is. And I just, I just have a hope that there's still men out there. There's still church people out there. There's still God's people. Yeah, they've, they've gone out a little bit. And they got hungry. And they were willing to eat anything. And when they started tasting what was out there, they recognized it wasn't right. Remember what God says about himself. Oh, taste and see what? That the Lord is good. You get a good taste of the real word of God. How does it taste? Tastes like honey. Honey's good for you. Tastes sweet. Sweet's good. Amen? Just ask my grandchildren. Sweet is good. Okay? That's what it tastes like. These guys, God put in us a sense to be able to discern what is good for us spiritually and what is not good for us spiritually. Let's be honest. We all still like to listen to that music that we used to like to listen to. Am I the only one? Okay. And every now and then you want to go listen to it. And you do. And the Holy Ghost is going, remember, you used to like this, didn't you? Taste it. Just take a sample of that song. What's that, what was that your favorite song? Take a sample of it. It tastes like death now. We can taste the poison in it. Because God's cleaned us up and we know what good food is. And we realize, I can't listen to this anymore. There's death in it. Amen? Reading things we shouldn't read anymore. Being around people we shouldn't be around anymore. Okay, here I'm still taking headphones out. Okay? But I'm just saying, I'm just saying, once you taste, uh, get a little taste of that poison again, you'll remember there's death in that. And you, won't anything, you won't have anything to do with it. Okay? And I mentioned this this morning. I'm probably not going to spend any time on this because it'll, it'll take a little while. But 2 Thessalonians 2 again. Lynn, you missed it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover this just for you. Okay? In John 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So here's God right here. Okay? Revelation 19, 13. Jesus comes back. He's riding a white horse, and his eyes are a flame of fire, and boy, he's got a sword coming out of his mouth, and the Bible says he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God, okay? So Jesus is the Word. He's the Bible. Now, 2 Thessalonians 2, turn in your Bibles there, and I want you to make this little notation in there, okay? 2 Thessalonians 2. Lynn was not feeling well this morning, couldn't, and it was too much party last night. No, it wasn't the drinks, it was the taquitos that got her, bless her heart. She asked me to taste them for her, she said, are they spicy? And I went, no, nah, they're good. She said, okay. I didn't know what her version, I didn't know that her version of not spicy was flour and water okay <laughs> okay second thessalonians 2 verse 3 let no man deceive you by any means for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition and i want you to notice this who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called god now, that hit me like a ton of bricks a couple weeks ago. It, he, the Antichrist will exalt himself, and we've already found out that this Bible is called God. He will exalt himself above this book. He will say, I'm above it. He will say of himself that, he, he, is, he is the spirit that says not everything that God does is in the Bible. He is the spirit that says God has many more things to say to us beyond what's in the Bible. That's who he is. When you hear that, 
You've got, you've got a lamb speaking like a dragon is what you have. When you hear, well, really the Bible should say this. You've got a lamb speaking like a dragon is what you have. Because that spirit is exalting itself above what is called God. And in this case, what is called God is the Bible, the Word of God. Does that make sense to everybody? So when you hear people correct the Bible, when you hear people the Bible should have said, when you hear people God has more things to say than what's in the Bible, or God does many, much more things than what is in the Bible, that's when you know you've got a lamb that speaks like a dragon. And they have exalted themselves above God by exalting themselves above His Word. Okay? Psalm 119 tells us there's one thing which you taught was you taught that you shouldn't say God and use his name in vain, right? Was you taught that, okay? What did it taste like? Soap. When you said words like that, it tasted like soap. I'll never forget the time my mom washed my mouth. I thought I was going to die. It was awful. Dial soap. Okay? Where's it going with that? That was good. Oh, here's God's name and a commandment that says, you should not take the Lord's name in vain. But then a statement by God himself, thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. Where does God place his word? Even above his holy name. That's significant. Because if that's where God puts it, that's where we should put it. And we wouldn't put ourselves and our mind above God's name, would we? No, that's why we're not supposed to take it in vain. It's because it is higher above us. If God's word is higher than even his name, that means we're under both of them. And not exalting ourselves above them. Let's stand to our feet. Stand and go to prayer. This is good discipleship training is what it is. This is preparing us to be good disciples and good soldiers and meat eaters instead of milk drinkers all the time. Amen? We need this. We need people that will dig into these deep things of God and learn them and know them.